to our uh, message for this morning from Psalm 121, because I actually want to use Psalm 121 to, to make this segue, is, um, well, let me, just, let me just do it this way. Let me tell you what Psalm 121 doesn't say. We're about to read Psalm 121 in a minute. Psalm 121 does not say, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Donald Trump. And after that, Psalm 121 doesn't go on to say, Joe Biden will not let your foot be moved now that he's in the White House. Joe Biden is your keeper, and he who keeps you, Sleepy Joe, will not slumber. Now, we're, we're, I promise I'm not going to dwell on the election again uh, all morning, uh, this morning. Um, but I do think we'd be remiss not to acknowledge, I mean, there's a pretty big thing going on in our, in our country right now. And uh, I don't think we've ever gotten election results more officially this close to, um, to a Sunday morning service. And so for what it's worth, I, I think it's important to acknowledge this. This was my Facebook post from last night. I said to my Democrat friends, I genuinely pray that President-elect Biden will live up to the best of what you saw in him as a candidate. To my Republican friends, I pray that your hope, security, identity, and faith is in someone far greater than President Trump. To my Christian friends, regardless of who you voted for, remember that the one true king is still on his throne. To my non-Christian friends, that King Jesus wants to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Trust in him tonight, and if you think the party in Wilmington, Delaware is exciting, it's a reference to Luke 15, 7. There'll be more you know, joy in heaven, celebration of the angels over one sinner who finds repentance. Uh, and to Joe Biden, I'm praying for you tonight, because brothers and sisters, God's word commands us to do that, regardless of who you voted for. First Timothy 2, 1 through 4 commands us, I urge that Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, especially for kings and for all in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so, would you pray with me this morning? Father, we want to do that together. As uh, your church here at West Hills, we pray for our newly elected officials, our earthly kings, those in high positions, our new congressmen and women, our judges and mayors, all of them, but especially for the highest position in our land, President-elect Joe Biden, we, we pray for your wisdom and discernment and governance for him in the months and years to come, that, that come January, he might govern in a way that allows us to lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. And Father, we pray for our current president, President Trump, that he might do the same, that he too would govern his remaining two and a half months in a way that encourages Christians to live peacefully, quietly, godly, and dignified. And Father, most of all, we pray for both of these men without knowing their hearts, only you know their hearts. Your word clearly tells us your heart God, your heart's greatest desire is that all people would be saved and would come to the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, you are our only hope in life and in death. You are so much better than any politician or party platform that this world has to offer. Jesus, you are our heart's greatest desire. And so this morning, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our country and its future. But more than that, Father, we pray for your church that you purchased with the blood of your son Jesus that whatever may come these next four years that we would continue to be light and salt in an increasingly dark and corrosive world and that we would never lose sight of the truth that our hope is truly in you and in you alone in Jesus awesome name we pray amen this morning as I said we're, we're studying Psalm 121 together as we begin to wind down our Psalms of Hope series this fall, uh, we only have three Sundays left in the, in the Psalms, and I know I have loved 
uh, preaching through these Psalms of Hope with you. I hope you've loved studying them as well. Uh, this morning we come to a really important one in the 20, 121st chapter because we've been highlighting all of these great, glorious truths about who God is, uh, the hope that we have in God, uh, God's listening, God's care, God's protection, God's redemption, God's deliverance, God's goodness, God's faithfulness, his help, his trustworthiness, his enduring, his strength, his rule, and all of these things that are true of God, it's, it, it, they are true, and we should find great hope in all of them. But the question before you and me this morning is, how about when life still gets tough? How about when you, when you know and you trust that God is listening and he cares and he protects and he redeems and he rules and you know all of that, but life still gets hard. I was thinking about it more this past week. You know, I think I really kind of ran a risk in preaching a sermon series specifically on hope in the midst of a pandemic-filled election cycle because obviously, you know, my intention in, in the series was to help us fix our eyes on Jesus in the midst of the chaos swirling all around us to remind us that our hope is not in this world but in the world to come but the risk that you run in doing that is that you all leave here on Sundays feeling reassured and hopeful but then on Monday you get hit with the weight of the world again and perhaps some of you at that point feel even worse because now on top of the temptation to despair you feel guilty that you're not more hopeful you think, well, gosh, the Bible is so hopeful. I'm hearing about hope every week. But if I'm honest, it seems like I struggle uh, to, to find any hope <laughs> throughout, throughout a lot of my week. And so if that's you this morning, I just want to be pastorally sensitive to that and validate that. If you are experiencing some cognitive dissonance these days between the hope that you experience on Sundays and that you long for, you know, in a covidless world and the despair that that seems to creep in on mondays i just want to reassure you this morning psalm 121 is for you this morning because the big takeaway here the main idea i think of psalm 121 is that as absolutely wonderful as it is that god protects and helps and redeems and delivers and strengthens and all of it it's all true but the fact is you and i need a god who goes even beyond all of that and who does even more than that, we need a God who can sustain us when things get tough in the here and now. We need a God who keeps us in the midst of ongoing trials in our lives. We need a God who promises to preserve us all the way to the end. We need a God who you can turn to in the hospital when you are battling COVID and they won't let your loved ones in. And it feels like you're otherwise left all on your own with all of your scary risk health factors you need a god who won't leave you when you're stuck in a rehab center for months trying to relearn how to walk and talk after undergoing major brain surgery for st suffering a stroke you need a god who won't let go of you when your father dies suddenly tragically in his early 50s and, and it sends you into a major crisis of faith as you struggle to, to, to believe that god is even still out there listening anymore these are not hypotheticals these are all real life actual members of our church facing these hardships right now and maybe you're not i mean perhaps all things considered life is actually pretty good for you right now praise god but i am sure that from time to time for all of us you know we face these more commonplace yet no less real trials of life and all the more so during a global pandemic and when you do you need a God who is somehow going to get you through, you know, the months ahead of being cooped up every day this winter indoors because it's too cold to go outside and everything inside is back closed again because it's cold and flu season and you're cooped up with your three toddlers under the age of four listening to Baby Shark all day long trying not to kill yourself or them. Uh, you need a God who can get you through that. You need a God who's going to see you through the depression that you're experiencing as a result, a result of working from home for the past eight months right, and desperately longing for real face-to-face -face interaction with your workplace friends. You need a God who won't give up on you and turn his back on you when watching services online on Sunday mornings during quarantine turned in to continuing to watch online after the quarantine was lifted, not because you were 
too scared to return in person like most of those watching us this morning. Where are you, camera? Where's our camera anymore? Oh, we moved it. There it is. There you are, virtual, virtual church. Uh, not because you were too scared, but rather because it was easier. Maybe some of you watching at home, if you're honest, it's easier. You've gotten used to uh, doing church in your PJs from the couch. We see you, by the way, on social media, like out at restaurants, in the gym. And then that became, oh, I'll just, I'll just sleep in and watch the service later in the day. And now you've completely lost any rhythm of prioritizing corporate worship altogether. Every one of these church members, what they all have in common is they need a God who's going to keep them. A God who's going to preserve them to the end. Through the ups and downs in life, our, our humps and our slumps, and specifically we need a God who's going to keep our faith, our faith steady and secure in him all the way to the end and praise god we have one that's what we're going to see this morning in psalm 121 so would you stand with me as you're able and turn in your bibles psalm 121 if you do not have a bible this morning we would love to gift you one of those as well we have plenty at the info bar i'll be reading uh, from the esv here we have words on the screen in front as well hear the word of the lord this morning I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the noon, moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we praise you this morning. For these good promises that we can rest in we can experience peace in this morning God in the midst of a chaotic world in the midst of a world that seems constantly in flux and change in motion slipping away from us nothing to, to hold on to God that you promise you will not let our foot be moved you're going to keep our going out and our coming in from this time forever. God, help us to trust you this morning. God, we, we need a faith that comes not even from us, but from you. We need a faith that is given to us, a sustaining faith, a lasting faith persevering faith would, would you give that to us this morning father would you use your word once again to, to strengthen and encourage saints here who feel like life is slipping away and need to be reassured of your keeping grace in their life and would you use your word this morning to to pierce through and to cut and convict to the soul of someone who has not yet trusted in you, who is trusting in the slipping, fading, temporal things of this world and is desperately searching for a sure foundation. Would you open their eyes and their hearts to see Jesus this morning, the rock that you invite us to build on? Would you call sinners to yourself this morning? We pray for your glory, Jesus. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, let me give you some context here. Psalms uh, 120 through 134 are all uh, delineated in, in uh, their titles as songs of ascent. A-S-C-E-N-T, -S ascent. Uh, commentators inform us that these were pilgrim songs to be sung when the Israelites 
or on their pilgrimage, ascending to Jerusalem for their annual feast in the Old Testament. So that's the backdrop for the visual that we get here in verse 1. The psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Commentator J.M. Boyce explains this can mean either of two things. First, a pilgrim approaching Jerusalem, uh, for, for, for that pilgrim, the mountains around the city suggest Jeru- Jerusalem itself. And so Jerusalem was God's city. It was the place God had chosen for his earthly, earthly dwelling. And therefore, to look to the hills really meant to look to God as one's true help. Or secondly, this stanza can mean a rejection of the hills for God himself. That the mountains with their high places had been centers for Canaanite religion in the Old Testament. Their gods were identified with the mountains, these mountain gods, and they were worshipped there with cultic prostitution. These high places are mentioned 78 times in the Old Testament where we are told that the Jews did not destroy them when they came in and occupied the promised land, Canaan. And they, and they instead often worshipped there themselves. So if this is what the psalmist is thinking of, what he is telling us here is that his gaze does not stop as he looks up toward Jerusalem and sees the mountains, but instead he looked beyond them to God and the heavens who made the mountains. And, to, and he's recognizing to worship the gods of the mountains or any other god or even the mountains themselves is idolatry. And as voice says, it is as useless as it is wicked. What we need is not the gods of nature, but nature's God. And that's exactly who you and I can worship this morning, Yahweh, who in verse 2, it says, who made heaven and earth. Scripture continually connects these two things, our trust in God back with who God is as creator. These are frequently connected, especially in the Psalms. Psalm 33, which we already examined a few weeks ago together, Uh, said, we trust in his holy name. Why? Because by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. We trust him because he's creator. Psalm 96.5 says, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. They're, They're useless. Don't trust them. They're powerless. But the Lord made the heavens. You can trust our God because he's powerful. He made the heavens. Nehemiah 9, 5, and 6, bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Trust him, bless him. Why? Because you are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. Therefore, the host of heaven worships you. Worship him as creator. Creation is the proof that God is able to keep us, to help us in our time of need. If God can make the galaxies and the geckos, solar systems and sunflowers, he is certainly able to keep you and me from stumbling. He has the power. God has all power. God is omnipotent, all powerful. And we'll discuss that in greater depth next week in Psalm uh, 139. But suffice it to say this morning, if God can create and uphold the entire universe by the power of his word, I think he can handle your midlife crisis. I think he can handle your friend group drama at school, students. I I don't mean to make light of our problems this morning because some of you really are facing serious, difficult stuff right now. And to you in the moment, I know it feels overwhelming but all the more reason that you need to be encouraged and uplifted and reassured by the hope of verse 2 here that your help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I was trying to think of an, an analogy to help us this morning. I, I, I just, this came to mind, I, I, I pictured my daughter Ellery, you know, if we wanted to take her out of school for a day, and the school policy is you need to notify the teacher It would be like Ellery freaking out over my ability, like whether or not I was able to send a quick email to her teacher to give the teacher the heads up. When she watches me write 5,000 word sermons, a 10 page paper every single week, like baby, I think I can handle a 10 second email. That is what our problems are to God. That, That doesn't mean he doesn't care about them. Like God loves us enough to take our worries seriously. He cares. But creation is the proof of his almighty power. 
is, that you and I don't need to worry about his ability to address our problems, to help us in our time of need. And the psalmist offers us two of his own illustrations of God's helping protection over our lives in verses 3 through 4. First, it's this picture of a vigilant watchman, like a, a, a sentinel, you know, watching out says he will not slumber as he watches over you and then in num- uh, number two in verses five through six the image of an umbrella it says i'll be a shade at your right hand on on sunny days that might strike us today as a bit of an odd choice of imagery umbrella but boyce explains there is genuine danger of sunstroke in such hot regions as the near east and uh then then you, you get that, the rest of verse 6 there, it's kind of interesting about the moon. There was some thought too in antiquity, as verse 6 suggests, that not only can the sun strike you by day physically, but the moon could also strike you with mental, emotional, psychological affliction by night. That's where our word lunatic comes from. This, this idea, you know, werewolves, this idea, you know, with the full moon that, that, that somehow lunar cycles can really affect us. Other interpreters think that the psalmist's point here is that God will protect you from both the heat by day and the cold by night, heat and cold. I think that really what it means is that nothing, nothing by day or by night, heat or cold, physical or psychological, nothing can harm us if God is keeping watch over us. That's it. As Boyce says, he is our shade against the visible perils of the day as well as the hidden perils of the night because, verse 3, he who keeps you will not slumber. Verse 4, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. See, the pagans in antiquity, they conceived of their gods in very anthropomorphized ways, very humanized ways ways people for millennia have been making gods in our own image we assume that god must be like one of us we are not omnipotent we are actually very limited you and i are so limited we've actually literally got to lie down and close our eyes and shut our brains off power down for at least a few hours every couple days or we will literally die that's how limited you and i are The longest recorded time without sleep in all of history is 11 days. You try and push it and stay up for 12, you're going to die. After just three days, you start to hallucinate. Scientists aren't even exactly sure why all of this is. The best explanation is probably just that God wants to remind you that you're not him. That we are very human, limited, and finite, and he is not. But for almost as long as people have been around on this planet, we've been dreaming up all these other gods who are not... Uh, who are like us, who we can therefore manipulate into doing our bidding. This is called idolatry, and God hates it. God tells us in his word that he has made us in his image instead. That is one of the most glorious facts in all of creation. We are made in God's image and not the other way around, but in our sinful rebellion, our desire like Adam and Eve to be gods, we turn around and we fashion gods in our own image instead. And it's as useless as it is wicked. The idea of God sleeping, of the uselessness of idols, is especially uh, uh, powerful and sort of poignant in the story of the prophet Elijah from 1 Kings chapter 18. If you remember, the wicked king Ahab wanted to kill the prophet Elijah because he wouldn't shut up about Yahweh being the real God and about how Baal, the Canaanite God, who Ahab preferred instead because he was humanized and so he could supposedly be manipulated. And so Elijah said, tell you what, why don't we just put it to the test, right? Um, you get your prophets together and I'll do my thing. We'll, we'll both march up Mount Carmel. We'll both build altars and we'll sacrifice a bull to put on each on each altar and then we'll just pray to our gods and we'll see uh, which one is the real one and so Ahab assembled 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah marked up marched up Mount Carmel all by himself the prophets of Baal went first and they won the kickoff and Elijah you know waited and watched kind of crossed his arms and the prophets of Baal prayed and they prayed and they prayed some more they prayed all day hours on end but nothing and so Elijah started taunting them He said, remember, you created Baal in your image. He's like you. Maybe he's just hard of hearing. You know, maybe you should pray louder. 
shout a little louder. Maybe he's relieving himself. Did you check like the outhouse in heaven? He said maybe he's away on vacation. Did he leave an out of office message up on, on his screen? Or he said maybe he's just asleep. You should, you should get louder to wake him up. And so the prophets of Baal, we hear, cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until their blood gushed out upon them. But verse 29 tells us no one answered. <laughs> no one paid attention. And then it's Elijah's turn. And he decides he's really going to rub it in, lay it on thick. And so he builds his altar, but then he douses the whole thing with gallons and gallons of water just to really pour it on, literally, you know, how much more powerful his God, Yahweh, is than Baal. And, and I think a lot of you know the rest of the story. God sends down a flaming fireball from heaven to consume the offering, and there's a great revival amongst the people, and they round up all the prophets of Baal, and they slaughter all 450 of them. It's a happy story. The point of the story is that real gods don't sleep. Real gods don't need to sleep. They don't need to be awakened. Yahweh is standing guard. He is watching out for you. He never takes a break. He doesn't take so much as a nap. And that means, verse 3, he will not let your foot be moved. Jude 24 puts it this way. It says, God is able to keep you from stumbling. Now, here's where I want to spend the rest of the sermon on this morning. We've got to answer the question, in what sense does God promise us not to let our feet be moved to keep me from stumbling because if you and I are honest this morning I don't know about you but I feel like half my life has been spent just stumbling I, I feel like I, I am such a sinner even the good choices I've made in life I have stumbled into like deciding to marry Polly deciding to have kids moving to St. Louis entering into minute don't don't ask me you know how the Lord called me into ministry I wasn't listening if he did uh, I, I trust that God made that call, but I was too busy stumbling around to pick up the phone. The story of my life is God redeeming my stumbling and using it despite me for his own good purposes. That still leaves us with this question, how can God honestly promise us that he won't let our feet be moved? Sometimes it feels like life is nothing but constant movement chaos in this world swirling around us the psalmist is going to say in verse 7 the lord will keep you from all evil all evil anyone not encountered evil this week now, some some of y'all have some explaining to do right because you just called joe biden pure evil on your twitter feed on monday and now he's the president-elect and so either you're a liar or god's a liar because he said he's going to keep us from all evil I'm getting distracted by the election again, but let's make it less political and even more serious this morning. There are millions of Christians all around the world this morning who are suffering from severe persecution for their faith in Christ. I subscribe to Voice of the Martyrs. Here's a recent email I got from them entitled, Thousands Displaced in Mozambique. It reads, Elisa arrived home just in time to see Islamists murder her father and her husband, who was a pastor. Her uncle had already been beheaded. Grief-stricken and fearing for their lives, Elisa and 18 members of her family headed south, joining more than 200,000 others fleeing the Islamist advance. So if you're Elisa this morning, and you pick up your Bible for comfort, and you happen to flip open to Psalm 121, and you read, the Lord will keep you from all evil, what are you going to think about that? I mean, do, do we have to redefine evil to try and get God off the hook so that God doesn't seem like some sort of crazy person watching Christians down here get slaughtered and beheaded for his name all while he tosses out empty platitudes like, I'll be your shade on a sunny day. Either we've got to do some serious exegetical gymnastics this morning to try and get God off the hook, or, or, maybe God has something else in mind when he promises to sustain us when he promises to preserve us to keep us that's the verb the psalmist uses six times in just eight short verses shamar in hebrew to keep to watch to preserve and by the way as an aside about the six times i love the observation that ws plumer makes in his commentary he says that good men 
must be very unbelieving to make it necessary for the Almighty so often to assure them of his preserving and protecting care as he does no less than six times in this short psalm. Remember Jesus said if we had faith, even as tiny as a mustard seed, we would move mountains. And I haven't done that any time lately. And so our faith is weak. It's weak. But praise God, his faithfulness to us is sufficient. And here is his faithfulness to us this morning, friends. This is what God is promising us when he says, I am your keeper in verse 5. When he says, I will keep you from all evil in verse 7. Notice something. Does it mean that he'll, we'll never encounter evil? Like we'll be just insulated in our little Christian bubble from all evil? No. Remember, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're definitely going to persecute you. In this world, you will have trouble. But notice something very important about verse 7. God doesn't promise to keep us from all danger. It doesn't say keep you from all danger. If you think about the Apostle Paul's list from Romans uh, chapter 8, of all the things that he says God promises to keep us with, that, that, that cannot keep us from him. Paul says, I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, powers, height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate, separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a beautiful promise. But here's the, here's the catch about that. If you flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and check out the list of troubles that Paul list that he has personally dealt with over the course of his ministry as an apostle, imprisonments and beatings and stonings and shipwrecks and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you start to notice something that Paul specifically dealt with every single type of calamity that he mentioned back in Romans chapter 8. And ultimately, he said neither death nor life, and ultimately he would face death, and Paul would be himself beheaded for the faith at the hands of a Roman sword. God does not promise us from danger in this life, Christian. Speaking of martyrs, this Psalm, Psalm 121, was historically one of the favorites of many early Christian martyrs, and they would recite it joyfully as they marched to their deaths. Is that some kind of bad joke? Like, did they totally miss the sick irony of what they were reciting and singing? Or did they understand something about the true interpretation of this psalm that you and I desperately need to appreciate this morning? That God doesn't promise to keep us from all danger, but he does promise to keep us from all evil. And he says specifically, verse 7, he will keep your life. I will keep your life. What's your life, friends? Is it the, the 80, 90 years that you will spend on this earth? The Bible says that is but a blip on the radar screen of your life, God's view of your life. The Bible says that part of what it means to be created in God's image is that you and I were created for eternity, that our souls are eternal. We were built to live forever. We're not like appliances these days that we all complain about. They don't build them like they used to, right? They only build them to last five to ten years because then they want to sell me another microwave or whatever. God is not in sales. He builds to last, to live for eternity. But that means if that dishwasher is going to last you for eternity to the end of time, you better take really, really good care of it, Right? You better have a maintenance plan that is also designed to last, designed to preserve, and God's going to have to keep us, and specifically, he's got to keep my faith, right? The Bible says the way that I live with him forever is by faith, and he's got to keep my faith. That's what he's got to keep. And so look, here's what I want to do our remaining time. I've got a list here of many <laughs> biblical promises that God makes us about how he's going to keep our faith. And I just want to warn you up front, be 
because sometimes I get accused, again, of trying to cram too much scripture into one sermon. It's like a fire hose. If I'm going to be critiqued for anything, if it's being too biblical, I'll take it. This morning, I, I'm going to warn you again, I'm going to intentionally do it because I want to overwhelm you with the fire hose of information, of, of promises from God in his word about this biblical truth that God will keep you if you are in Christ. God's preserving, keeping mercy over us in our faith. We Calvinists call this the perseverance of the saints. It's one of the most you know, hotly debated theological questions among Christians is can a true Christian lose their faith? We tackled that question specifically. That was the topic of the sermon, of a sermon I preached back in February when we preach through our tough text series, the 10 toughest text in all of scripture, and I exposited Hebrews chapter 6 for you, uh, one of the most frequently cited passages by Arminians, the sort of counterpoint to, to Calvinists, Arminians, Christians who believe that we can lose our faith, and I showed you why they're wrong, right? You are, why you're wrong. If you're here this morning, we have, I know we have some Arminians at West Hills. God love you. We love you. We welcome you. We worship with you, but you're wrong. It is wrong about this. And I'm going to show you, you're dead wrong, dangerously wrong, I think, on this very important theological question. I'm going to show you why I think it's so important this morning. Let me try and just hit the highlights in the time that we have remaining. Philippians 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, Paul writes, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, so... First question, what is the good work? Well, I want to suggest that the best work that God works in anyone's life is our salvation. God's rescue of a guilty, otherwise condemned sinner from the clutches of death and sin and hell by the power of Jesus' blood. Jesus liberating us and adopting us into his perfect heavenly family. That is the greatest work that has ever been done in my life, in your life, if you are a believer, in the life of anyone who has ever repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus for their salvation. That is the greatest work. But here's the thing. The New Testament uses the, the word save, sozo in Greek, in, in all three verb tenses past, present, and future, frequently. There's a very real sense, vitally important sense in which believers have been saved, past tense. We were saved, as the great hymn goes, the hour I first believed. God worked a miracle in your heart, spiritual rebirth, regeneration, death to life. Ephesians 2.8 says, by grace you have been saved through faith, past tense. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, past tense. Behold, the new has already come. It's done. It's finished. Your salvation is complete, secure. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. It cannot be taken away from you. That is amazing news this morning, brothers and sisters. The Bible calls this justification. It is a legal term that means to declare innocent. You and I stood guilty in God's court of law, condemned in our sin of high treason and rebellion against the king of the universe. But Jesus stepped into the courtroom and willingly took upon himself the chains, the punishment that was rightfully owed you and me. We did the crime. He did the time. And the Bible says that in his sacrificial death, in your place, on the cross, that justified us. It made us, declared us innocent. Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. Romans 5.1, we have been, past tense, justified by faith. We now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now, that would be good enough news for you and me this morning if, the, if, if salvation was only past tense. But the gospel is even better news than that. Because the New Testament says we aren't just saved, past tense, we are being saved, present tense. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, I preach the gospel by which you are being saved, Paul says. 
1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross is the power of God to us who are being saved. The Bible calls this, present tense, uh, dimension of, of salvation, it calls it sanctification. This ongoing work of salvation as God works that grace, that gospel, that, 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 that salvation in and through every part of our life. It's a beautiful thing that God in his mercy would free us not just from the penalty of sin at our justification, but from the power of sin progressively over time as we are further and further sanctified for our remaining days on this earth. We are being saved. We are being set free from the power, the grip that sin once held on different parts of our heart. Once again, that would be good enough news. But the gospel is even better than that because it's not just the penalty of sin. And it's not just the power of sin. God promises that one day we will be saved, future tense, will be saved from the very presence of sin altogether in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God has destined us to obtain a salvation. We will obtain it through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9 does a good job of bridging and tying these different dimensions of salvation, past, present, and future, together for us nicely. Paul says in Romans 5, 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more so shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We have been and we shall be. Scripture calls the shall be, the future tense, glorification. And so here's the thing. These three dimensions of salvation, justification, sanctification, glorification, past, present, future. What does any of this have to do with Psalm 121 and God's promise to keep us? We already said that it's not a temporal promise. It it can't be. It can't be a promise for this life only, for this world, or else God would be a liar. Because my feet slip all the time out here. I run into all kinds of evil out here. God must mean something much bigger when he says, I'm going to keep you in Psalm 121, and I think the keeping that he has in mind in Psalm 121 is exactly the same keeping that Paul is talking about here in Philippians 1.6 when he promises that he who began a good work in you will bring it forth to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God will complete his good work of salvation in your life, all three dimensions. Those God justifies, he will sanctify those he sanctifies, he will glorify. You don't, you don't just opt in for one of those parts without the others because we have a faithful God. He, he, he keeps those he calls. And we don't have to speculate about that being the good work that Paul is alluding to here in Philippians because we can flip over, over to uh, Romans chapter 8 where Paul writes what I just said almost verbatim In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, he says, For those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, that's a beautiful promise, but all too often we stop right there in verse 28, don't we? And we just pull that out of context. and, And we apply it just to this life. Like if the promise was just for this life, then the promise would be that you know, one day I'll be able to be on my deathbed and I'll be able to look back and realize how God has perfectly orchestrated all the events of my life, even the tough times, worked them all together in his master plan for my ultimate good. I couldn't see it at the, at the time, but now I can see it. You know, my parents divorce, that's a good thing. You know, those tough years of marriage, my kids wandering from their faith, uh, all of it makes sense now in this life. But if we actually read Romans 8.28 in context... I think the promise is even better than that. Because verses 29 and 30 go on to say, for those whom he foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And here in Romans... This gets into some some pretty crazy, mind-bending, time-warp type theological stuff, but but the truth is that because God is omniscient and God transcends our our sense of time and space, 
God is even talking here in Romans 8 about our glorification in the past tense. It says those whom he justified, past tense, he also glorified, past tense. Like we're already glorified, you and I, in God's eyes. How is that possible? Because in God's mind, once he has set his mind to the plan to save us and set it in motion, to justify us, to sanctify us, to glorify us, it's already as good as done. It's as good as done. Because God makes good on every promise. God sees through to completion every good work that he starts. And so let's bring it back now to Psalm 121. God keeps us. He will not let your foot be moved. If you're standing on the rock, if you're standing on Christ, you're you're built on a firm foundation Jesus said the winds and the storms of life will come, but God will preserve you. He will keep you. He will keep your faith. That's what he's keeping. God is keeping the faith of those he calls. Jude uh, addresses his short letter in the New Testament this way. It opens with Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Those whom God calls, he always keeps. Hebrews 12, 2 puts it this way, let us look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He's not the founder and improver of our faith. He's not the founder and enhancer of our faith. Jesus is the founder and perfecter of your faith. Raise your hand this morning if you've got perfect faith here. Okay, seeing none, me neither, I have to conclude that that means, unless God is a liar, that means he's just not done with us yet, friends. Right? That he's still working on you. He's still perfecting your faith for the remaining days that you live out on this earth until he at last brings you home and your faith becomes sight and you meet him face to face finally, ultimately perfected, God will continue that work. He will do it. He perfects that which he founds. Jesus doesn't start jobs he doesn't intend to keep and and, and, and to finish. You're a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. Some of us take more work than others. But God's promise is to see the job through to completion. He will keep you all the way to perfection. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 reiterates the same promise. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He'll do it. He will. He promises. He will sanctify you completely. If he's begun it, he won't stop. He doesn't give up on his people. I don't have time for all the rest of these. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, God will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. 1 Peter 1, 5, you by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I've got a whole other list that I, we could just go on and on of God's promises to keep you. But here's the thing, friends. God only keeps, here's what I want to end. God only promises to keep those he calls. So how do you know if you're called? If you're one of God's elect? Well, in one sense, I'm calling you right now. We sometimes in Reform theology talk about two dimensions of God's calling. There is a general call that everyone who hears the gospel receives. If you're here this morning... And you're not daydreaming about, you know, lunch. You are receiving God's general call this morning to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus for your salvation. Now, whether or not you will also receive God's effectual calling, the calling by which God actually regenerates a heart, causes a dead heart to start beating death to life the old has gone the new has come whether or not you receive that effectual calling only the holy spirit 
can determine that this morning. I can't do that for you. You can't even do that for yourself. But here's what I will tell you. It's between you and God. It's, it's, it is a relationship. It's between you and the Lord. Relationships are a two-way street. And listen, I'm as reformed as they come. And so I, I'm certainly not saying that you have anything to contribute to your own salvation because you don't. We come with empty hands or we come not at all. You know, if it's up to you, you will screw it up. Like that's, how, that's my view of, about how much we can contribute to our salvation. If it depends on me at all, I'm going to screw it up. It all has to be God's doing. But he, we have a role to play. And here's the role. Hebrews 3.15 declares, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. God has to touch your heart and, you know, perform spiritual CPR and cause it to beat and to come to life. But God commands us not to harden our hearts. That's the choice you have to make this morning. Are you hardening your heart to the Lord as he's trying to speak to you through his word? So much of his word this morning, passage after passage about his choosing, his saving, his keeping. Will you harden your heart or will you soften it to the word that God wants to implant in your heart right now? Let me end this way by reading the rest of that end of Jude, beautiful benediction, Jude 24 and 25. This is my prayer over us this morning. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. The only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion, authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray.